co-chairs. Senator with regard to why we're holding this event. Um, there's an upcoming uh, dialogue regarding the World Summit on Information Society. There's a preparatory meeting next week, I believe, um, regarding the upcoming uh, summit. A report came out this summer which details some of these internet governance issues. Uh, the, the two leaders within the United States government uh, for a briefing of congressional staff on this issue. So uh, we're really thrilled that uh, Senator Burns is paying so much attention and that, um, that our two esteemed panelists have come to uh, join us. We want to thank them. We want to thank congressional staff and advisory committee members for coming. We also uh, want to briefly introduce uh, our panel, which isn't really a panel. It's uh, more of a duo for today's briefing. Acapella uh, duo. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be no singing involved. This, this event will be webcast on, uh, on our website at netcaucus.org. It'll also be podcast, the audio will be podcast from there. Um, the World Summit, uh, the Working Group um, on Internet Governance Report that I mentioned that came out this summer is posted on our website for download and you can also go to the World Summit uh, Working Group on this issue at WGIG.org, and you can also find a link um, on our website. So first, let me introduce um, uh, Mr. Michael Gallagher, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Commerce and Communications, but Secretary of Commerce for Communications and Information Administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Uh, in his role, he serves as the President's Principal Advisor on Communications Policy and directs the NTIA as it serves the Internet Domain and Address System. Uh, following Mr. Gallagher will be Ambassador David Gross, who has served as U.S. Coordinator for Inter International Communications and Information Policy in the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs at State Department. Since appointed by the President in 2001, he has 20 years of experience with communications and telecommunications law and has led numerous delegations to international, international telecommunications conferences. Um, they're both Mr. Gallagher and Mr. Gross are, are, are personal friends and uh, business colleagues, so they have a good rapport and um, looking forward to, to hearing from them today. We'll follow that with um, some question and answer. We really looking forward to congressional staff questions. Uh, statements uh, will be discouraged, so um, we welcome your questions. And there's a microphone in the middle, four questions after the presentations, um, and that's for the listening and viewing audience at home. Thank you. Mr. Gallagher. Let's see which microphone that was you knocked out there. Well, it was a pleasure to be invited uh, to come on up here and, and visit with the Internet Caucus Advisory Group for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, it's been 10 years since this group was formed, and I had the honor and the pleasure, and some of you may even remember me from 10 years ago when I was Chief of Staff to Congressman Rick White, Rick White one of the original co-founders, and it certainly is refreshing to see how organized this group has become and how uh, established it is to be able to actually run lunch and fill a room of this size. It wasn't always that way from the beginning. And then as was mentioned, uh, to be here with David is an absolute pleasure. David is uh, a good friend and a colleague for a number of years. And David, what is this? This is probably about the 20th city we've done this together in. Uh, we travel the world uh, talking about how important it is for us to be opening up markets for our workers here, spreading the ideas of freedom that I'm sure David will talk about to the rest of the world, and uh, making sure that the policy foundations are open to our genius here in this country. It's an honor to do that on behalf of the administration, the American people, and it's even a greater honor to do it with my good friend David. Um, first, I understand it's helpful for us to explain kind of where we sit in the org chart. Uh, as a, I'm, I'm the Assistant Secretary of Commerce, not the State Department. Um, Normally that's internationally when that gets done. <laughs> and uh, I sit at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is charged with doing several things. Uh, one, it's the principal reservoir of advice and knowledge on telecom policy to the administration, to the president. Second, we co-manage the radio frequency spectrum, something you all are very familiar with here on the Hill, uh, with the FCC. It's our job to look over the federal government users. And um, uh, the FCC looks after all others and then uh, make sure we're, we're overseeing that, that resource effectively. Then the uh, third thing that we do is, if for purposes of, of our discussion today, is we are the contractual overseer of the Internet's domain name system. It's also suggested that 
you know, at least I give a brief, brief explanation of what the domain name system is. Uh, very simply, it's the authoritative phone book of truth that is at the kernel of the Internet, at the core, that when you go to www.house.gov, that translates to a series of numbers, and that series of numbers and those letters match up in an authoritative way that when you put that in to a search, you actually get to the House's website. No offense to our Senate colleagues, but I came from the House side. Um, so that's, that, that's the focus of uh, when we talk about the DNS. Uh, before we get into that in any detail, though, I, I really want to just take just one minute to say uh, thank you to our telecommunications industry here in the U.S. Um, for those of you that are watching the relief effort going on after Hurricane Katrina, our carriers are working together, uh, deploying millions of dollars worth of uh, aid and doing everything they can to, co to redeploy service down in the Gulf Coast area, and they're making great headway. And so on behalf of the administration, on behalf of the people down there that are being, having communications be restored, uh, we appreciate your efforts. We know the challenges that you're facing. And uh, we look forward to the day when the area is completely um, uh, reconnected again to our country through telecommunications. But on to the, uh, the focus. The important thing to keep in mind from the Department of Commerce's viewpoint is we are looking at this uh, exercise, the World Summit on the Information Society and ICANN and those related exercises, is how do we make sure that we are creating job opportunities and growth opportunities and innovation opportunities for us here at home? That's the fundamental focus of the Department of Commerce. And the President has given us uh, how we're going to accomplish that. The President says, what is the role of government? The role of government is not to create wealth. The role of government is to create the environment in which entrepreneurs can flourish, minds can expand, and technologies can reach new frontiers. That's the focus that leads us. So how do we create that environment? So we go from country to country, we look at these larger overarching discussions, how do we do that? So that's the fundamental goal. Now, looking at the policy structures that we have, uh, for those of you that have worked with uh, Commerce, with NTI over the last four years, you know we've taken on a number of policy initiatives, re-examined the foundations of why, we're do, why we do things, how we do things. Are these 21st century policies or 19th century policies? And we've gone about systematically uh, making sure that we're ready to engage the 21st century world. First it was with uh, spectrum policy, and you have the President's uh, spectrum policy for the 21st century. It's broadband, and the President's vision of universal affordable access to broadband for all Americans by 2007. And the next policy that came up was, all right, how do we manage the DNS? What should we be doing to make sure that we are discharging our responsibilities relative to the domain name system in a making sure that, that there's stability and security in the core of this resource of the Internet? It's not the entire Internet. It is the DNS. It is a critical piece of it, but it's not the whole thing. But the one piece that we have, we must be doing everything we can, be deploying our voice resources effectively. What we have learned over the last uh, 10 years of experience is, one, the Internet really has changed everything. And the numbers are pretty staggering. When you look at where we were, um, these are from a variety of sources, in 1995, there were 16 million Internet users in the world. Today, there are 888 million. Um, the DNS queries, how many times was the DNS queried per day, was stood at 20 million in 1995. Today, it's 14 billion. Emails sent, 8.4 billion in 1995, 1 1.5 trillion today. Now, hopefully not all of that is spam, but that's a significant order of magnitude. And then we see the same thing with e-commerce. So we see the, the medium is, in fact, exceeding the expectations that people had for it even during the bubble. Now, also, when we look at the United States' role, we are the world's number one Internet economy. We are the world's number one broadband economy. We have over 200 million Internet users in the United States. We have over 38.9 million broadband subscribers in the U.S., according to the FCC's last report. Um, and com quite confident it stands at over 40 million given the first quarter announcements from the top 20 Internet service uh, providers in the United States. So here we stand. We are 47 percent of the world's e-commerce flows over U.S. broadband pipes. We are number one in the world in the number of hotspots deployed in the world with over 28,000 of the world's 68,000 hotspots. There are a variety of metrics that prove and that measure where we are. We care very much about how the DNS is administered and making sure 
that it is stable and secure for the long haul for the 21st century digital economy that we all are benefiting from and living in. So the focus in looking at the success, it's been the reliance on the private sector. It is the ingenuity and the genius and the rapid ability to meet challenges that is the private sector's, uh, uh, it's the American private sector's unique uh, place in the world. Those same traits are what has made the DNS robust enough to meet the growth uh, that I just described. And it's that same focus on the private sector, focus on innovation, the focus on capably trusting the marketplace in many cases to solve uh, difficult issues, especially of a technical nature. And ICANN today is the embodiment of that private sector relationship between the government and, and the Internet itself. And so after a period of time, we uh, had a govern uh, administration-wide discussion about what the direction is, and we announced the four policies in June that we intended to govern Internet policy for the foreseeable future. First is that we will take, the United States government will take no action that will uh, have the potential to harm the stability or security of the DNS. Second, we recognize that there are, this has become a worldwide medium. The metrics I read you are worldwide numbers, not just U.S. numbers, and in fact, we will see greater growth in the Internet, uh, likely in Asia and in India and China and in the former Soviet Union, we'll see more rapid growth there because they're coming off of a lower base. They have greater populations than ours. This is a worldwide medium, and we need to make sure that their administration, their country code, top-level domain, is sensitive to their sovereign concerns. And we look forward to engaging in discussions with the world on that. The third point is that ICANN, as the technical manager of the DNS, is doing an admirable job of making sure that the pipes keep working, that we're able to, the DNS is able to meet the growth of the Internet around the world. And we intend to stand behind as a country the private sector leadership that has brought that about and continues to deliver on that promise to all of us here at home and, in fact, all around the world. And finally, that to the extent that the rest of the world needs to interact with us on issues like cybercrime and phishing and spam and other it challenges that may come up in the Internet space that are not of a technical nature relative to the DNS, can tell you, when you sit down with market-oriented democracies and speak with them about the Internet, they have become much closer to our way of thinking and recognize the importance of the Internet to the growth of their economy, and strength and stability are very important to them. And we are putting our efforts behind those goals to ensure that that will continue for the foreseeable future. And so when we look at the World Summit, and David can tell you about the other pieces that are engaged there, which we care very structure in countries around the world. These issues we care about very much as well. But I look forward to um, listening to all of you. If you have concerns, I look forward to working with you. It's a pleasure to be back here. And uh, now it's all David's. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Uh, I don't want to make this into one of these really embarrassing how much everybody up here loves each other sort of thing. Uh, but let me, if you'll indulge me, uh, as Mike indicated, he and I uh, go back a long ways. And uh, we were in business together. I knew him when he was up here on the hill. I won't say how long ago that was, but you've given some hints about that. Uh, but uh, let me just sort of say one thing uh, that maybe is an illustration about the extraordinary job. I'm going to do something which I'm really not supposed to do, which is since I'm an ambassador with the U.S. State Department, I'm supposed to keep to my international knitting, not talk about domestic issues. Uh, but last week I had the uh, in interesting uh, week. I was in Israel in the West Bank meeting with uh, the Minister of Communications 
for the Palestinian administration and a bunch of others. And uh, they've got, as you all know, no lack of very, very difficult issues. And one of the really significant difficult issues that they're struggling with uh, has to do with spectrum-related issues and how the Israelis and the Palestinian Authority uh, will be dealing with each other. And, uh, of course, as you all uh, can imagine, there is lots of angst, lots of difficulties, few clear solutions. And one of the relatively clear solutions that I offered up, and I haven't even told Mike this, is they need somebody like Mike Gallagher, who has really done some extraordinary things that you all, uh, I think it's, it's well worth paying attention to. Uh, one of the problems we have here in the United States and around the world has to do with spectrum and largely because the good Lord is not making any more of it, how we effectively use what we have. Uh, and the, con the contest among different types of of agencies and focus, all of whom have very good stories to tell. Uh, the Department of Defense on the one hand, uh, commercial users on the other hand, uh, all of whom have important uses. Um, but Mike and, and our colleagues at the Department of Defense and elsewhere, but really it was, it was Mike's really doing here, working with the FCC and others, but again it was Mike's doing, was able to free up a tremendous amount of spectrum for commercial uses without harming our domestic uh, and international uh, defense-related issues. And it's really quite an extraordinary thing, and one which I keep telling the rest of the world, like the Palestinians and the Israelis, they need to find creative solutions like Mike has been able to find here. Uh, let me first start off with a little bit about what it is, why an ambassador from the State Department is talking about telecom issues. Uh, I recognize, although I've been in the industry for 25 years or so, it is not intuitively obvious. Uh, it is obvious why the FCC is involved. It is obvious why the Department of Commerce is involved, particularly when you realize that uh, the pedigree there is coming out of the White House and being the President's chief advisor on telecom-related issues. But many years ago, up here on the Hill, it was recognized that international telecommunications was becoming an extraordinarily important thing for the United States. And so the decision was made to um, have some particular focus on those issues. And they looked around the usual suspects to try to figure out where that should be housed. And as you probably know, the Federal Communications Commission, although it has a very large international bureau and quite good international bureau, is an independent regulatory agency and therefore uh, cannot speak for the U.S. administration as a matter of law on these issues. So they decided that it would be important to have this position be in the State Department uh, both so that our international telecommunications policy can be in harmony with our foreign policy generally, uh, but also to give us some of the advantages of having uh, someone who can play in both the diplomatic world and in the technical world. And I will say, uh, as I look around the world, it is a unique uh, situation and one that gives us great advantages. In fact, I'm impressed by how many ministers and others now come to me to ask exactly how we came to do things the way we do it because they see the advantages that this brings to the United States that others don't have. Uh, and probably nowhere is more clearly are those comparative advantages than in the World Summit on the Information Society uh, that Mike uh, referred to. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of background about this. Uh, as you know, the United Nations holds a major World Summit approximately once a year. Sometimes it's on sustainable development or on financing or a whole host of issues. But back when the International Telecommunications Union had its plenipotentiary, which is every four years, conference uh, back in Minneapolis in 1998, the idea came forward that perhaps the issue of the use of technology to help in development, particularly in the developing world countries, use technologies, particularly information technologies, to help their people would be worthy of having discussed at the heads of state level. And in fact, just perhaps indicating what we're, the time period we were talking about in the late 1990s when all things seemed possible and all things could be solved through the use of technology, uh, it was such a popular idea that they decided not only to have one summit, but rather to do something unprecedented, and that is to have two phases to the summit. And we had the first phase of the summit uh, in 2003 in Geneva, Switzerland, I'm told it was the largest UN summit outside of New York ever held. More heads of state, more delegates, uh, 
And I will tell you that uh, I, since I had the great honor of leading the U.S. delegation, uh, I was really, really concerned about this uh, because I thought, what is there really in it for the United States, which is my job? I understand why a lot of other people are interested in this, but is this really just going to be another opportunity for people to sort of beat up on the United States or another opportunity to try to regulate things that ought not to be regulated and so forth? But because of the very hard work done by the, st the team at the State Department, the team at the Department of Commerce and at the FCC and Department of uh, Treasury and Defense and many, many others, we got a document, actually two documents, agreed to by our heads of state and other senior political leaders in 2003 that is truly an extraordinary document. It is a document that was agreed to by consensus and one that talks about the importance of free enterprise. It talks about the importance of allowing telecommunications to be uh, less regulated. It talks about the importance of freedom of expression. For the very first time the United Nations in that document, the countries agreed to the importance of freedom of expression with regard to the internet and other new technologies. You just go through it time and time again, and it is an extraordinarily powerful document. And one that I use on a regular basis as I travel around and meet with from China or Russia or anywhere else, and I use that document and I remind them of what it is that their leaders have agreed to. It's an extraordinarily effective tool. But we come to this year and we have another phase of this summit. It will be the last phase of the summit. Um, and it, we are faced with a whole host of new challenges. One of the big issues that we had back in 2003 as we were negotiating those documents was the issue of internet and internet governance. Now let me just say sort of parenthetically, this is actually very good news for the United States. And I don't think that's really fully appreciated because when people hear that other countries, China, India, Brazil, others, are interested in talking to us about the internet, caution flags, and understandable caution flags immediately go up. They certainly go up for me and for, and for our team. But why it's such terrific news is because it means that the discussion going on globally is about the things that we want the discussion to be about globally. It is about the opportunities that come, the economic, the social, the political opportunities that come from a tremendous new engine of growth, the internet. And the fact that the conversation is no longer as it once was in the early and mid-90s of trying to convince countries to use the internet, to allow their people to have access to the internet. Now it's exactly the opposite. Now all the discussions are, what can we do to bring more access to our people? How can we use it more effectively for government services? How can we bring health care to our people using the internet and other technologies and the like? That's what we want that discussion to be about. Now, I don't want to be sound too optimistic and too rose-colored glasses. There are real challenges. And what we saw in 2003 was an attempt to try to rein in some of the advantages that we see from the Internet. And we were able to deal with that issue back then by pointing out that when people use the term Internet governance, no two people, even on our delegation, had the same idea of what we were talking about. It's such a plastic concept. It's not one that <coughs> means the same to any two people. And so what the agreed-upon position at the end by the world uh, in the first phase of the summit in Geneva was that a group of experts would be convened by the Secretary General of the United Nations to define the term Internet governance, to identify the public policy issues associated with it, and to make certain other recommendations. And that those that would be brought into the preparatory process for this summit, they'll be held in Tunis, Tunisia in November of this year, in just a few weeks away. That report was issued uh, in uh, mid-July, uh, and I believe there are copies of that report out in the front if you really have trouble sleeping or afraid you need to write some paper and you need to make sure you have the quotes exactly right. Uh, <coughs> In fact, let me just parenthetically say for all you who will go back to your offices and go, God, I don't really remember what this was about or where to find this. Uh, let me give you a brief uh, advertisement for our website where 
virtually everything you need to know about this stuff is either there or hyperlinked from there. And it's not the easiest. It's a State Department. We're not technologically so sophisticated. It's not the easiest website address you've ever seen, but it's www.state.gov. That was the easy part. Slash E slash EB. I told you it wasn't easy. E slash EB slash CIP, Communications and Information Policy. And if you need to, just see me after this, and I'll repeat that uh, uh, to you. But anyhow, you'll find on there lots of information, lots, as I said, lots of hyperlinks to all this sort of information. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, the negotiations now about Internet governance and a whole host of other issues to prepare the documents for the summit in November. I mentioned before that the summit in Geneva in 2003 was the largest, I'm told, ever held by the UN. I am assured by the Tunisians, and I am sure they're right, that this will be even larger. More heads of state, more senior officials, more delegates, um, and it will be the first time the UN is holding a heads of state summit in the broader Middle East, and so it has tremendous importance for that. If you doubt that, uh, you might be interested to know that the Tunisians, as they were required to, but they, they did so, invited Ariel Sharon to attend not that long ago. And there were riots in the streets of both Tunisia, which is not known for their riots because they have a very strong, shall I say, uh, central government, uh, but also in neighboring countries as well. Uh, so passions uh, flare up. Uh, I can't claim that the uh, riots were about internet or the internet governance issues, uh, but it does give you an idea of the sensitivity about these things generally. Uh, as I said, we have a number of jobs to do as we negotiate the text of these documents. First and foremost is not to lose that which we already have. The statements of extraordinary power about freedom of expression, about the appropriate role of government, about the appropriate role of rule of law, about IPR, and a whole bunch of other extraordinarily important issues for us and for everybody else. But the second is to try to understand better where we're going with this and how to satisfy the legitimate needs of other parties. And so we're working very hard. Uh, we believe, of course, with tremendous passion and zeal that the genius of the Internet was its less regulated nature. Uh, that government should stay out, but for those few very, very narrow situations where it's needed, and Mike indicated what those were. Uh, but yet we also hear very much, and this is again part of the good news, about the importance of the Internet to other governments and to other people. And that's very apparent. There isn't a government that I meet with that isn't basing their governmental services in large part because we suggest they do so on the Internet. And so the stability and the reliability of that tool is of legitimate importance to them. And so how we can engage in a dialogue that gives them comfort about our intentions and the role of the U.S. government, while at the same time not endangering one iota of the sorts of things that we care about and are important, not just for the United States, but because we think they're important for everyone is the challenge that we have now over the next couple of weeks. Uh, it will be a very challenging time. Uh, as you can imagine, the usual suspects in terms of governments uh, are not automatically supportive of the U.S. position on many things, and this is not any different than that. Uh, but I am very optimistic that when all is said and done, we will find the path forward, and that, in fact, we will be able to not only defend that which is important to defend, but encourage the growth of the Internet, encourage the growth of the types of things that are facilitated by the Internet. And in part, and I'll just stop with this uh, thought, if you had any doubts about the importance, not only economically, which I think no one doubts, but socially and politically about the Internet, the past 12 months are an extraordinary What has happened in Lebanon, Georgia, the Ukraine, the Palestinian territories, Iraq, Afghanistan. Much of the power of what has happened is the ability of people to communicate today in ways that were impossible or extraordinarily difficult just a few years ago. 
whether it's wireless technologies, whether it's the internet, whether it's a host of other things, the impact is profound in changing the world. And so that's what the summit's about, and that's what Mike and I are trying to work on. Thank you very much. Open up to questions. If anybody can take the mic for our listening viewers at home. It's also helpful if they could just name and where you're from. That's right. yeah. uh, my name is Randy Barrett. I'm with National Journal Tech Daily. <clears throat> uh, the ITU has been very involved in this. They have a report out. There's a lot of people around the world that want, uh, I guess some of them want uh, Internet governance to perhaps move toward uh, the, the United Nations. And yet I keep hearing from the two of you, and it's been now a number of months, that that just ain't going to happen. And now I want to, can you can you tell me exactly your position? I mean, just ten words or less, Mr. Gross. <laughs> is it going to happen? Are you going to let it happen? I'm a lawyer. Ten words or less. <laughs> Gee, that's just not fair. Oh, yeah, that was it. Next question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the internet will not be in charge of the. I'm sorry. The United Nations will not be in charge of the internet. Okay. Period. Okay, no, I like that. Now, Mr. Gallagher? All right. Uh, we're on the same team. Yeah. <laughs> the answer is so no. Same thing. The answer is yeah. no. Okay. okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. My name is Wendy Liebowitz. I'm from the um, B&A's Electronic Commerce and Law Report. Thank you for your presentations. I have two short questions. One is about the .xxx domain, which uh, debuted <laughs> recently, and I wondered if our uh, the actions, <laughs> if the actions taken by Mr. Gallagher um, complicate your position, Ambassador Gross, and what you think the future of this domain is. Secondly, in terms of ICANN generally, the position of the U.S. government according to the four principles that you set out, which is that no action will be taken, basically, that jeopardizes the security and stability of the Internet. I hear that a lot. Um, but there are real complaints about ICANN that I hear about how difficult it is for people to get a quick, clear decision about the, the lack of transparency and the, they want more local control. I hear this from people in Britain, from Nominet. I mean, these aren't concerns from, from tangential people. They're saying we want local control. Why should we have to go to a California-based institution to make administrative changes in our own sovereign country code domains? So I just wondered how you might respond to that. Thanks. Uh, th let, me, uh, let me answer part of that, and then I'll turn to Mike, because uh, there are two things, and I, I want to be very responsive. Uh, one is, uh, obviously, the Department of Commerce uh, is the primarily uh, slightly differently but hopefully this will be helpful to you Wendy and if it isn't please just let me know uh, the problem let me first mentioned to people just uh, if, unless you know the, the dot triple X is the question of whether or not there should be a, a domain name basically a, that would be a, a for uh, well the sorts of things you'd expect the dot triple X to be for uh, and uh, but for me the actually the, the more fundamental issue that as I see it or at least as it's often presented to me is uh, I am as probably as much a zealot on the First Amendment as almost anybody I know. I can't say everybody I know, but almost everybody I know. Uh, and, and I think that's really one of the great reasons why the United States has prospered in, in virtually every way. Having said that, uh, you don't have to be on my job very long to know uh, that it's uh, our belief in the First Amendment and the power of the First Amendment is a very singular one. There is no other country in the world that believes the way we do about unfettered access to information and the like. And by that, I'm not just talking about the usual suspects who clearly don't believe in it, but rather even many close allies believe that the line should be drawn in ways that we don't find comfortable. And so putting to one side the issue of pornography and things like that, you know, there are certain things that are obviously on one side that everyone would agree is inappropriate. Uh, and uh, the real issue for us internationally is we believe passionately about the importance of the free flow of information. 
And for that, as you know, and as everybody here knows, we put virtually no restrictions on that. Um, but it would be naive for us to think that just because we say that should be the way of the world, makes it the way of the world, whether it's cultural issues, economic issues, social issues, a whole host of things. The rest of the world doesn't see it exactly the same way we do. And so how we fit ourselves into that world and that world into what our worldview is, is where it's tricky. Now, dot triple X is, is one example of that, but I wouldn't want people to think that it's, it's somehow unique. There's a much more significant core issue, which is partly why the part that on the World Summit that we talked about earlier on about the freedom of expression was so important to us. Mike? Yeah, just, uh, Wendy, just to fill in a, a couple things. First of all, the question has not been posed to the Department of Commerce. Uh, it's resting with the Board of Directors of ICANN as a procedural matter, and that's uh, their province uh, to handle their process as they see fit. Uh, as you all that are in the media know, I sent a letter uh, probably about a month ago suggesting that they make sure that their process is inclusive of all of the views that were being shared with us in the department and including those views that we were hearing from our international counterparts about concerns of a variety of natures uh, relative to how this was going forward. And they heeded that by allowing um, an additional month or so, and it's being handled within their board process. So the question itself has not been posed uh, to, to, the, to the Department of Commerce. Now, as to um, ICANN and its uh, opportunities for improvement, I would say that, yes, we have heard the same concerns from our international counterparts, which is why you see two of the four elements are very focused on making sure that they can elevate their performance to meet the expectations of all of the participants in uh, the growth of the Internet, not just uh, uh, those that perhaps are happy with the status quo. Okay, So we listened to the rest of the world and we said, all right, especially with their top, if you look at the complaints that we hear, Wendy, they're very focused on how their CC, their country code is handled, their top level domain, that if there are some improvements we can make there, we should. All right, and it also, if we, want, if we need to talk about other issues that are more real governance related, right, like content, or like uh, spam, or cybersecurity, or cybercrime, those things are, that's not an ICANN issue. That's not really where their competence lies. It's also not where their ability to execute an outcome is going to lie, because governments ultimately, as policymaking entities, make much of those decisions. So what I would, uh, um, what I would focus on is that we are, seeing an opportunity to re further refine those things. And if you look at ICANN, we, they signed an MOU, was it uh, two years ago? They have one more year to go on this, on this version of the MOU. And they've made substantial progress in bolstering their organization, uh, more reliable uh, funding, um, and a greater ability to, they're, they're much improved over where they were two years ago, but the story's far from complete with a year left and multiple tasks yet to be performed. But if you, you have to look at it and say, all right, if you look at it on balance, this ICANN process as a manifestation of the private sector and its ingenuity and its genius and its adaptive nature and uh, innovative ability, that's the f what we want to keep working. And um, just if I may, forgive me for interjecting, for those of you in the room um, here today, uh, interesting opportunity for congressional staff, representatives from the ICM registry, which is the applicant for the dot triple X domain, are here with us today. Um, some they're peppered around the room: uh, Mark Pearl, Kelly Emmerich, Jay Beckwith Burr, and Bob Cornry Vieira, representing ICM registry. So, if you wanted to ask them any questions, and I also want to plead. Um, to any of you that are hemmed in um, that can't get to the microphone, feel free to just stand up and ask your question and, and we'll call on you. So don't, don't make the getting to the microphone the prerequisite to asking a question. Uh, Amal Sharma with Congressional Quarterly. You, you both mentioned uh, that there were some transnat lots of transnational type issues, policy issues that, that have sort of complicated uh, the ability to solve certain problems, cyber crime, security, um, spam, even online piracy, online gambling, the list goes on. I'm just wondering, from a 30,000-foot level, what's, what's the United States sort of approach to dealing with those kinds of problems, if not, you know, some sort of new uh, intergovernmental body? What, what's the way to deal with that? Should there be treaties of some sort or, or whatnot? I, I just wanted to add, we've seen that in, cover, in terms of covering Congress and the legislation that they pass. There's always limitations that are noted by, you know, staff and members as they're passing a bill that, you know, we're stopping X, but someone could still set up a server in another country, and we, you know, can't control that. So 
you can address that sort of thing. Let me, let me start off. Uh, And each one has to be tailored to meet its particular needs. The World Summit, for example, gives us some tools automatically. And by that, I mean it helps us highlight some of the importance. So for example, with regard to uh, some aspects of cybercrime and the like, we have a Council of Europe in which uh, it's not limited just to Europe. In fact, uh, we have uh, signed up for it. Uh, we believe that uh, virtually all countries than it is working and doing capacity building with other countries to make unlawful those things that ought to be unlawful. I mean, uh, for example, many of you will remember the I Love You virus out of the Philippines a number of years ago that occurred. It turned out, if I remember correctly, that it turned out not to be illegal in the Philippines to create such a virus. Uh, so that's now been changed, and we provide our FBI through uh, a variety of multilateral organizations, including the APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative Group, uh, provide capacity building to help countries work both on passage of domestic legislation that ought to be done, and then work on cooperative ventures. We have MOUs, we have some treaty-based things, but each one must be looked at very carefully and try to identify, not just because what will work well sort of looking outside, but remember these things work two ways. And we always have to be very careful about what impact it has on our citizens as well. Uh, and so we need to always look and understand very clearly what the story is there. And then lastly, of course, as you might imagine for this administration, uh, we don't think that the answer is always governments making, uh, taking certain actions, but rather we look to the private sector as well. And I, I would just, for example, with spam, which I think are two classes of issues at least. One is the issue for service providers and the clogging that Mike referred to before, uh, which is extraordinary and very costly for them. But then the second is for consumers, like my family, like myself as well. And there, I, you know, I, I just look at the world as I see it, uh, and I experience it. And I, for example, use an ISP for which I get virtually no spam at home now. Uh, I've got a, it's got an excellent spam filter, so it suggests to me that there are some technical solutions to some aspects of these problems. I will parenthetically say that I get a lot of spam at the State Department because they clearly have a very inadequate spam filter. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, clearly how you choose to, to implement technology is important as well. But that's a little bit about how we look at each one of those issues. Mike? I've won four lotteries today. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't take my money. <laughs> yeah, uh, great question. And I would say that it starts for us. We have, again, the best informed world. technological issues of the day, whether it's, you know, phishing or spam or whatever it is it's five years from now, because, you know, certainly phishing was not a term that people were worried about or farming three or four years ago, right? We're going to continue to have these challenges. Uh, we look to the private sector. Certainly that's how we do it as the Department of Commerce. Say, all right, well, where is the real source of the problem? Where is there a policy role? And where is there genuinely a technical role? Well, when we look at those issues, the rest of the world is watching us. Right? Because of our unique role, our leading role, they'll follow our example in many cases or perhaps refine it a bit within uh, their sovereign regime so that they can arrive in the same place. So part of it is uh, when these difficult issues come up that we look there for the answer. The second thing is the rest of the world often follows or at least says, all right, we're going to vector off of that as a, as a pivot point. We also have more at stake than anyone else. As I mentioned, these metrics about the importance of the Internet to our economy uh, we need to make sure we get these things right. So again, as other countries come up that curve and rely more on the Internet, they again will see the benefit of uh, our path. And in many cases, it's our private sector that's working within their countries, right? Because two -third, over half to two-thirds of the revenues of our largest tech companies here, their revenues come from abroad. And so they're able to be instrumental in making sure that we're creating that environment the President talks about in many different uh, aspects or ways. And finally, 
there are multiple, as David can tell you, I mean, he hosts these things and he tirelessly travels the world. Uh, you have multiple bilateral arrangements where it's an economic discussion and part of it all is on one of these more troublesome topics. Or we have, was it the U.S., Australia, and the U.K. have a trilateral agreement on? Well, we have, uh, there's a, actually a spam-related. Spam-related agreement, yes. Yeah, cyber FTC is, is uh, uh, FTC's so part of that. Agreement, right? And so you look at it, there are very positive discussions that can be had, and the knee-jerk reaction must not be create another worldwide bureaucracy. It just slows things down. It actually makes things more complicated over time. Let's rely on the structures and the communications that we already have, solve everything we can through that route, and then we'll have the leftovers that we have to work with, and it's a much more easily identified piece, and then we can address it. Which is why we need a spyware bill, right? <laughs> Monica Trinnell from Senator Burns office. I, um, I just have a question. Do you think any uh, specific U.S. legislation is necessary, given the concerns that you've touched? And if so, what would that look like? Domestic. That must be you, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, right now, we have uh, a tremendously vibrant uh, uh, environment here at home for the growth of the Internet and all of the things that feed off of it. I don't believe that there's a uh, request, especially vis-a-vis -vis the World Summit discussion that's going right now, there's not a need for a specific piece of legislation to take over to the World Summit in order for us uh, to articulate our view. David's doing a fabulous job with his team, and he has Sally Shipman here and Tim Finton with him today, who are two members of that team. Dick does a fabulous job, Dick Baird. Um, they, they, they make sure that everyone's aware of exactly the benefits of what we're seeing, because the first thing you want to do is attract people to your position, also let them know the limits uh, of how, we're, how far we're willing to go. I, there is benefit in solidarity. When there can be expressions of support from Capitol Hill to the direction that we're taking, that's absolutely helpful and much appreciated because then there's a greater signal of strength and uh, domestically it helps us send the right signals to our marketplace that this administration, this government, up and down both sides of Pencil both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue are in support of the direction they're going for growth and job creation. Hi, Miriam Sapiro from Summit Strategies International. I wanted to, um, first of all, it's a real treat to have you both on the same panel, and <laughs> no mean feat given your travel schedules. Um, I wanted to ask you about this idea of a forum. I actually made it to the end of the WIGIG report that Ambassador Gross referenced earlier, and in it there was unanimous support for setting up a new forum for policy discussion and debate. Now, I can think of a lot of other ways to accomplish that goal, but there was unanimity, and it seems that other governments that have weighed in on these issues are starting to support your primacy on security and stability, but also saying very kind words about the idea of a forum, and it's something that's not this uh, increasing swell uh, among governments and others for a new forum? Well, let me, uh, uh, it's of course a, a real challenge for us. Um, what we're going to try to do is accomplish at least two things which, as Miriam points out, may appear at first blush to be inconsistent. Uh, we want other governments, we want other institutions. In fact, one of the things I should mention that's somewhat unique about the summit is it's not just governments, at least in theory, not just governments, but rather civil society, as they call it in Europe, NGOs, others, are active participants. And in fact, the most of the delegates will probably come from, from those sectors. Corporations are actively participating as well. Uh, and so we want all of those groups talking. We want dialogue. We think that works for us because we think that the story that we believe in is one that is persuasive uh, and benefits all. So we welcome a dialogue. We welcome a dialogue on all of these types of issues uh, because not talking about it doesn't make them go away, but rather by addressing them, we think we can resolve many of these things. Uh, and, and we think they get resolved on terms that we're very happy with. Uh, having said that, how you do that without creating a new bureaucracy or run an unnecessarily high risk 
that such a group then becomes some sort of decision maker or otherwise uh, be empowered or feels it's empowered to do things that would be antithetical uh, to, uh, to these interests is the challenge and one that, uh, but it's, it's a challenge I think the world is up to trying to figure out what those terms of reference would be, how this thing would work. Uh, but, you know, the United States doesn't run away from the challenge of trying to articulate why we think things are right. Mike? I think you nailed it. This is uh, fundamentally, Dave, David has very capably got his finger on the pulse of where the direction of the rest of the world's going, and uh, we have great confidence and are very supportive of his efforts to strike the right balance. It is critically and vitally important that nothing that is done in that space inhibits the dynamism of the Internet as a medium going forward. Okay. <laughs> I'm Braden Cox. I'm at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And my question concerns um, cultural protectionism because I think that's a something that we've seen going on um, in the world with the lots of countries censoring content. And um, Mr. Gallagher, you mentioned that, well, the U.S. acts and the rest of the world follows. That's my concern, actually, with regard to cultural protectionism. Um, you know, the, the June 30th Declaration of Principles uh, reasserted the U.S. control over ICANN and, and um, the domain name system. And then shortly thereafter, the U.S. government sent a letter to ICANN saying, well, we're worried about the triple X domain. And my fear is that maybe that might be looked upon as a structural control of content and somehow might set a precedent to the rest of the international community that indeed it's okay to control content through filtering mechanisms as well. So um, I guess my question is, do you think that is a pre precedent that the rest of the world might bring up in November? And uh, how do you, uh, I guess, Ambassador Gross, how do you maybe... You know, that's a, a, on content prote protection or the, the decisions that countries make about what their people see and don't see. Um, obviously, we support, uh, as David mentioned, when we talk about extending freedom and freedom of speech and expression, that's a principal value here. When people are talking about the Internet, they're talking about that. That's a great thing for us because when you look at the ability to um, capture the speech and come up with the ideas that are going to move the world. Our country is very, very skilled at that, and we have much of that within our borders. So we want to see that be extended as far as possible. It's a fundamental principle. When you look at uh, what's going on as a real matter in the, in the marketplace, China and a number of other countries have very effectively blocked content. There are limits on the uh, U.S. authority to impose its views of what's best for other countries on them, and it's not realistic for us to expect those barriers to vanish just because we would like them to. So, but you have to look at the reality of it at the same time is content control by governments uh, is pretty pervasive. There was a recent uh, Business 2.0 article that was actually fairly helpful. It had a map around the world and showed the degree of blockage for various types of content by countries, and that's their sovereign ability. We can talk with them about it. We can share our views with them. In some cases, we ne can negotiate them, but we can't stop it. And so I think we have to be very, uh, have the ideal clear in mind, but also know what the reality is for today's uh, the world that we have to operate in. And the U.S. should set the right example in that regard. I believe we are. Okay. Categorically believe we are. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, quick question. John Nevitt from Network Solutions. Um, what could we in the private sector do to help support your efforts in the next couple of months? God, I love a question <laughs> like that. Question. <laughs> Can you say softball? Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and he, he didn't plant it either. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No I, no, I appreciate it. And actually, it is one of the things which I generally talk about uh, because it, it is one of our other comparative advantages uh, besides the fact that we're on the side of the angels. Uh, and that is... Uh, through industry and others, uh, more often than not, have operations in other countries. Uh, one of the things, it, it's, it's so obvious that I'm embarrassed to say that I had to learn it on the job, uh, but uh, when I go as a government official and tell another government official they ought to do something, it's really rare they do it just because I ask them to do it. Uh, usually it takes, you know, explaining why it's in their interest. The most credible group to tell them what's in that country's interest is not the U.S. government, although hopefully we have some credibility in that area. It's actually people in that 
country. Now, again, I'm not trying to say that just because a couple of com companies get together and say this is a good thing to go that governments will automatically follow. It's a much more complicated process. But it is a very important tool. And to the extent that uh, many companies see the sorts of things as we see it, uh, that's a very helpful tool to have those companies in those other countries working with those governments and explain why it's in that country's interest to take these certain actions or not to take actions. That's been very powerful and it actually is one of our comparisons. Yeah, I, I would just say that a um, couple of things. Our job creation engine, we've created over 4 million jobs in the last two years in this country. That's more than Great Britain, France, Japan, um, and two or three other countries come. and it helps bolster the efforts that David and his team tirelessly carry on every day. And if there are no more questions, on behalf of all those advisory committee members and the Internet Caucus members, I really want to thank you and the Ambassador for coming to brief us today and also your, your great staff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>